There are some interesting things going on in the South Okanagan around cover cropping. The main crops grown in the region are tree fruit and grapes. Selecting an appropriate cover crop can prove challenging due to the region's low rainfall levels and the limited water holding capacity of the predominantly silty and sandy soils. Additionally, these soils tend to have low organic matter. But despite these challenges, there are some interesting trials underway in the area to address these issues. At Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada's Summerland Research and Development Centre in Summerland, BC, Dr. Kirsten Hannam is exploring various soil cover management practices within tree fruit production. As part of the trial, she is experimenting with woolly thyme as a ground cover to support the goals of increasing soil organic carbon, water and nutrient retention and possible carbon capture. My name is Kirsten Hannam. I'm a research scientist at the Summerland Research and Development Centre. I work for Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada here in Summerland, BC. We planted this trial in 2020. Um, one of the main purposes of this trial is to explore various soil management practices that could be used to increase the amount of soil organic carbon uh, underneath the trees. Typically that area underneath the trees is maintained um, vegetation free through applications of herbicide and we found that through long-term maintenance of plant-free soil um, we get a depletion of soil organic carbon and we realized that this area of an orchard is really prime for increasing soil organic carbon um, we want to increase soil organic carbon because it helps improve soil health. It also helps improve a soil's ability to hold on to water and nutrients. And we've also identified increased soil organic carbon as a great tool for climate change mitigation. When carbon increases in the soil, that carbon is prevented from moving immediately back into the atmosphere and carbon dioxide um, is one of the main greenhouse gases responsible for climate change. So we're exploring practices that could be applied underneath the tree to increase soil organic carbon, but we want to also um, find practices that are effective in increasing soil organic carbon while also using water and nutrients efficiently so that they don't compromise the fruit quality and yield of the tree. We have three main soil amendment treatments in this trial. The control treatment is the conventional practice of maintaining the soil surface plant-free through occasional applications of herbicide. And then we're comparing uh, the amount of soil organic carbon and water use uh, in two other soil amendment treatments. One of these is a wood chip mulch treatment as a means of suppressing weed germination and improving water use efficiency. And the third treatment is a woolly thyme cover crop. We're using it as a green mulch. So we chose this woolly thyme because we believe it's fairly water and nutrient use efficient and it spreads across the soil surface and, and reduces evaporation from the soil surface. I was looking for a, a variety or a species that could be planted under the, under the trees, that wouldn't climb up the trees, that wouldn't be highly competitive for nutrients and water, and wouldn't harbor a lot of rodents and, and other pests that might um, compromise the health of the trees. I think the three soil amendment treatments show some pretty interesting differences just in, based on pure observation. So, the bare soil treatment does need frequent management for weeds. Um, the soil surface does get a kind of a, a very hard crust on the surface over time, which can be quite difficult to break through. The wood chip mulch tends to get fewer weeds growing on it, and it definitely helps the soil stay moist. We have observed, however, that the tree roots tend to grow along that interface between the mulch and the mineral soil, and we're curious what implications that has for water access for those tree roots. Um, by contrast, the woolly thyme uh, can be tricky to establish. At first, we didn't managed to find woolly thyme seed to establish it so we planted plugs 
and because this is a conventional orchard we, we still couldn't use herbicide to suppress the weeds so we had to visit the orchard three or four times through the year to hand remove the weeds. So that can be a hassle for someone who's managing a large orchard because it can take quite a bit of manpower to maintain it weed free while it's getting established. The need to hand weed is becoming less frequent as the woolly thyme forms a continuous mat over the soil surface. Um, but unlike the wood chip mulch, it appears that woolly thyme um, green mulch doesn't cause a redistribution of the tree roots, the tree roots still grow deep the way they would in the, in the conventional or, or bare soil treatment. And at the same time, there does appear to be a small reduction in water use requirements for irrigation with the woolly thyme compared to the control treatments. Here we're looking at a hole that I've dug underneath the woolly thyme and you can see the tree roots, unlike in the wood chip mulch, grow deep down into the soil, seeking out soil moisture. You can tell the soil's damper down at the bottom of the hole where the soil is a darker color. And that's where you see lots of roots growing. I can also show you um, the woolly thyme itself has really shallow roots. They're very fine and fibrous and they just stay near the soil surface. Our qualitative assessment of the woolly thyme seems to suggest that woolly thyme is really promising as a as a cover crop or green mulch in in orchards. Um, there are several properties we like about woolly thyme. It doesn't require a lot of water or nutrients and in fact seems to prefer not being directly irrigated. You can walk on it, you don't need to mow it. It produces a really lovely purple carpet of flowers that the bees seem to like. It doesn't climb over, up and around the stems of the trees, so it doesn't shade them. It's very tolerant to lots of direct sun. Woolly thyme is a perennial and it appears to be very winter hardy. We haven't had any winter dieback of any kind. And if you do get patches here and there, it's easy to transplant a little bit from one chunk to another place. So once you've got it established, it seems pretty easy to maintain. So I've dug a hole here at the base of a tree in a treatment that we're maintaining conventionally. Our conventional treatment is um, soil surface maintained weed free through occasional applications of herbicide through the growing season. I'd like to show you two things. First, these pieces came right from the soil surface and you can see that there's a really distinct crust that develops when there's no plant cover. And this crust isn't ideal because it prevents water from easily percolating into the soil, um, either as rain or irrigation, um, which is unfortunate because these trees need irrigation to stay productive. Another interesting thing to see is that these roots have started to grow nice and deep down into the soil. Um, and they're growing into the part of the soil that's slightly more moist um, so that they can access water. So as climate change falls upon us, uh, drought restrictions become increasingly likely. And if we have soil management practices that we can use to help us be more resilient to drought or extremes in water availability and heat, we want to find those treatments. So we're looking to see how the trees respond. If we turn the water off, how quickly do those trees become drought stressed? And does a woolly thyme or a bulk mulch help those trees um, resist water stress through time? We also visited Karnal Singh Sadhu at his Kalala Organic Estate Winery in West Kelowna, BC. Not only has Carnell been involved in a multi-year cover cropping study with researchers at the Summerland Research and Development Centre, he has also been trying a few innovative practices of his own. Oh, my name is Carnell Singh Sidhu. Yeah, we are running uh, to call Kalala Agriculture Limited. 
it's uh, all certified organic vineyard and we also have certified organic apples here we started uh, making wine in 2006 and we opened to public in 2008. A few years back I have a fellow from Santa Lucia he scout through the vineyard and uh, he find five different fungi on the cover crop which he said it feed on the powdery mildew. So technically that's controlling the powdery mildew than uh, having problems. I truly believe actually nature takes care of things. When we start interfering with the nature, that's the problem start. As much as Carnell truly believes that nature has a handle on things and the less we interfere, the better off the crop is, he has recently been involved in some cover cropping trials conducted by Dr. Madi Sharifi, an Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada research scientist. Dr. Sharifi conducted a five-year study examining three different alleyway cover crop mixes and three different undervine mixes measuring biomass, weed suppression, and carbon and nitrogen accumulation. Carnell shares his observations of the trials. One thing I really noticed is that where we have a growing uh, the cover crop under vine, they fairly control the other plants. And like uh, lentils, they're not high growing, they don't go into canopy, but they also, some other other plants, so they kind of controlling them. And the crops growing their vegetation, it helped to control us disease and insect, because it hosts lots of beneficials on it. They do also, add some nitrogen to the ground. Because when you pick a cover crop, you have to think a lot of things. Does it really suitable to plant in vineyard? Because vineyard don't need too much water. If a cover crop needs lots of water, then it's not gonna work. So you have to find a cover crop which will be suitable for both. So it's easy to do. Otherwise, it will be uphill battle if you start a cover crop which needs lots of water. The vineyard don't need lots of water, or you cannot water in certain time of year the vineyard, then it will be a problem. Carnell is always thinking about different ways to do things, and this is where he decided to trial planting a cover crop that would not only benefit his soil and plants, but could also benefit his income. He is experimenting with cover crops that can double as a cash crop to potentially have some of the unused land between his vine rows work for him on many levels. In the 2023 season, he planted chickpeas in the alleyways of the vineyard to not only reap the benefits of a nitrogen-fixing plant for his grapevines, but to also harvest a crop to eat and sell. It was a little challenge to seed because we don't have a seeder. That's how we seed it, just uh, with the hand. And the tra uh, with the tractor, we have a cultivator behind the tractor, make a, a line, then someone seed in those lines. The problem with that, they grow with jigjagging. Right, that's a little hard to control weed. So in the future, I think we are looking to have a cedar. This year, I know it's not uh, viable what uh, we're doing, but uh, next year we probably do a little bit better. It's like take, I think four or five years before we can say, okay, it work or not. It's like experimental stuff, right? There are lots of other things involved in it. Uh, how are we going to harvest? We can do two, uh, there are two methods. We can pull it out, which is the easier method to do, pull it out. Uh, it's, uh, but uh, that, uh, I don't get any benefits from it. But I want to do, I want to leave the root in the ground, so I get benefit from that knot where they absorb the nitrogen and uh, other nutrient. I will cut it here and uh, that the part I will send to the market if we can sell it uh, as a whole. Because people can use it as a salad, the leaves, and they can use this and they can cook these, uh, they can take these out and even can eat raw. They taste very good too. And this one is not uh, fully done yet, but that, uh, you can eat them raw. And that's, uh, they taste really good and sweet. Yeah, that's the reason we want to do it. We want to get the benefit, both benefit. One, economic. Other, the soil benefit. We want to get, that is economic too, then you don't need to add a, add a, a nutrient to it. So we, it's for us, work good. You can sell the part from the top and the bottom part, it help to grow your other crop. It will be, where it will go. Uh, I, I'm thinking take into the, some local fruit stand 
to see if they can sell it. And uh, I'm thinking talk to uh, Indian grocery store if they're willing to sell it. And otherwise it will go to our own house and uh, my worker's house, wherever we can cook and eat it. <laughs> Kalala's chickpea cover crop trial is being monitored by the BC Living Lab project. The Living Lab is monitoring various different aspects of this chickpea trial. Everyone knows that climate change is a big deal and it's something we've got to get on top of. First of all, we've got to capture more carbon, but also we've got to reduce how much um, greenhouse gases are leaving our systems, especially agriculture. Agriculture is a huge source of greenhouse gas emissions, but it's also a huge capacity to store more of them. So this project was started to get farmers on board to change their practices and help them become part of the solution. There's always a gap in agricultural research, right? The scientists do the research, make these recommendations, but sometimes they're not realistic or there's just poor uptake by the farming community. In this case, we wanted to make sure that the farmers were going to be able to do it and it was going to be good for them. Vineyards are an interesting example of agriculture because there's so much land base that doesn't have plants on it, right? You've got the grapevines, but you've got all that space under the grapevines, between the grapevines, especially since viticulture is having such a hard time adapting to this new climate regime. I think it makes a lot of sense for viticulturalists to have secondary crops on their systems. There's the room, it can be good for the system, and it would be good for them to have a secondary source of income. Chickpeas are an interesting choice for Kalala. Interesting in that, like I said, they're good for the soil, which will be good for the ecosystem, but also I think they're a pretty desirable crop. I mean, pulses are becoming mainstream in North American diets. I guarantee they're going to see a big change below ground and hopefully above ground too in a good way because plants change the soil and soil changes the environment. So I'm optimistic we're going to see something pretty exciting.